my lovelies, welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Today I'm going to be covering a case that I have covered on several documentaries, but I thought, did I cover it deep enough? And the answer is, no, I didn't. Also, I'm croaky still, because I've got a chest infection. Does that deter me from coming on here and doing yet another true crime with me? No, it doesn't. Just be very empathic because I'm quite poorly. Anyway, enough of all that. Thank you to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. I really appreciate it. It makes a massive difference to my life right now. But also, as I say every time, if you are struggling, please don't subscribe to it. As long as people are subscribing here and writing their thoughts and feelings, then honestly, I am happy as Larry. Whoever Larry is. I've always wondered who is Larry. Those sayings have to have started somewhere, right? So was Larry just somebody who was really happy? Today's case I'm going to cover is Aaron Campbell. But before I start talking about Aaron Campbell, who's a young killer, I want to talk a little bit about the research on teens that kill. I wrote quite a lot about this when Aaron Campbell carried out the murder that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to go through what my thoughts and feelings were around young people that kill. And I want to be clear, young people kill for different reasons and young people who are killers are different types of killers. So this is me talking about what I would consider a psychopathic killer as opposed to a young impulsive killer. They are different. Nonetheless, bear with me on this. So the research on teens that kill does not suggest the main reason behind the actions of teenage killers. It's more a culmination of ingredients that leads to an activation of a potential predisposition for antisocial or sadistic behaviour. Many experts believe that genetics are part of the problem because research indicates that the majority of violent criminals carry the gene known as MAOH and CDH13. This noted, around 30% of men actually carry this gene, meaning that more is required than simply that profile to carry out sadistic murders. Now, individuals who kill often have attachment issues, so issues with their parents, family members. They don't necessarily feel that real connection. And they may have been physically or emotionally abused, neglected as kids, and we have to be honest, they are some of the deepest fractures that anyone can experience. That said, to be fair, most people who've had horrific upbringings and abusive childhoods do not become killers. Now, other research highlights more organic impairments. So we have people like criminologist Dr. Adrian Rain. He scanned lots of brains of convicted killers and he actually compared them to ordinary people. And he found that serial killers have lower activity in the prefrontal cortex area of the brain. And when you think about that area, it's the area that controls aggression. It's where the concentration of impulse control is. So we all have impulse control issues. We all know when we're in an argument and we think, I'm going to punch you in the face. But a bit of our brain goes, don't do that. That will result in an assault charge. And it stops us. But imagine not having that impulse control area. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on in those situations. And when they look at psychopaths, one of the things they know is a real shrunken amygdala. Now, the amygdala is a bit of our brain that goes, eat food, drink alcohol, have wild sex, take drugs. It's just that kind of hedonistic area of our brain. And again, it's a big part of the brain that controls emotion. And one of the issues with psychopaths is they have a shrunken amygdala. And because it controls emotion, that shows that there is a reason why they have a lack of empathy, remorse, guilt, and also that they struggle to understand the impact that they have on others when they cause them pain. Now, finally, on top of all of that, there is always the autonomous choice of the individual. Choice exists no matter who you are, no matter what your problematic genetic, environmental, familial or physical factors. You can still make a right choice or a wrong choice. What interests me 
is what separates a teenage killer from their peers because they decide to take a choice that means that they murder people. And that's really interesting. Now, I'm also going to be really honest. You know, if you've listened to my YouTube before, I have a concern around the way that we look at young killers compared to older killers because there are differences, right? Adult killers and teenage killers are different. And the reason for that is, ask yourself this. Have you changed from when you were a teenager? You know, when you look back at when you were 13 years of age, are you the same person that you were then? I mean, you've got to admit it. It's rare that an adult reflects on their youth and thinks, hmm, that's exactly the same person that I am. You know, a lot of us when we were teenagers were disrespectful, we were aggressive, we lacked confidence, and there were so many variables that caused us to be the human beings that we were then. Teenagers are not fully formed. They have lower consequential thought patterns, they're less sophisticated in their ability to read emotions because their brain is still developing. And none of that is going to excuse cold-blooded murder. However, as opposed to this making them somehow worse than their adult counterparts, it would suggest that they've not fully become the human that they have the potential to become. Arguably, with the right compassion therapy, education, consequential understanding, and at times medication, these young people do have the potential in some cases to be rehabilitated, no matter how difficult that might be for us to get our heads around. This opinion, I know, causes a lot of anger. When I say this, I get a lot of angry people get in touch with me. They're like, they're a murderer, they need to be killed. But it's like, honestly, young people's brains are not fully formed. So an individual young person who callously and purposefully snuffs out the life of another person, sometimes in the most tortuous of ways, can be rehabilitated and can be offered freedom, as contentious as that may be. The person that I'm going to talk to you about today, Aaron Campbell, is somebody who, in spite of everything I've just said, tries my beliefs in that theory. There are so many reasons for that, and I'm going to go through them, let alone the 117 injuries that she suffered before she died. Nonetheless, I think it's really important to distinguish killers, because some killers who are young people can undoubtedly become good citizens in the future and some are rare even in their bracket of killers. Aaron Campbell chose the most defenceless child he could have possibly chosen. He enjoyed her suffering. He enjoyed her agony. He wasn't just a child molester, a sadistic killer. He was potentially an individual who will never be safe to walk the streets amongst us again. And there are lots of reasons I'm gonna talk about that today that I believe validate my belief system. But one of them is that he said he felt very satisfied with the killing. This was a child, a young child beginning her life. And his reflections on the killing is that he felt satisfied. The disassociation he has from the horror that he caused reeks of a complete lack of empathy. And I'll be honest, if he hadn't been caught, if he hadn't been sentenced, I cannot otherwise but draw a conclusion that he would have killed again. And when I look at the sentencing, which we'll talk about later on, I genuinely think that he didn't believe that he deserved to be punished. That in itself worries me. The level of arrogance that this young man has is terrifying. And I just want to make it clear before I go into the ins and outs of this case, I don't believe that Campbell was influenced by his computer games. I really don't. 
that is a big part of the defence argument. I think a lot of kids play computer games that are really, really, really violent. Does that make them killers? No. In fact, research doesn't even support that. Yeah, research says that kids who play computer games that are really violent can have what we would know as a momentary lack of empathy, i.e. if I was in the classroom and I did an experiment where a teacher walks past and I drop a pencil on the floor, the kid who's played the computer game might be less inclined to pick it up for the teacher. But pretty much five minutes after that's happened, the empathy rate goes back to normal. So when we're talking about Aaron Campbell, we're talking about a young man who has an inclination for the macabre and also seeks out content that feeds his predilection. It is not that the content creates his predilection. And I guess that for a lot of us listening to me now, before I start talking about this case, you want to know, can we actually look at teenagers and spot these kind of killers? And the truth is, to some degree, possibly. Because research suggests that you can spot problem behaviours in young children by measuring the deceitful and callous scale. So children who are high scorers on these scales are more likely to be less pro-social. If you see children who do things that are negative but don't seem guilty after they've misbehaved, that's another indicator. If you punish them and it doesn't change their behaviour, if they have selfish intents and care mostly about themselves, they don't share, they only seem to have themselves in regard, that's an indicator. If they lie, that's an indicator. And also if there is the sniper sneaky behaviour, where they try to manipulate people to get around situations, that is also an indicator. And then of course, our stalwarts. If they like setting fire to things, if they like hurting animals, if they're involved in criminal behaviour early on, all of these are really high risk factors. But I do also want to note that there are also children who are just really terrorised by the world around them, from the way they're parented to the experiences that they have with other peers and their caregivers, and they struggle to contain their age. Or maybe they even have their sexuality or their identities affected by abuse. And even when I'm talking about those individuals, let's be honest, 99.9% .9 of them, they turn out completely the opposite to killers. They turn out sensitive, compassionate, even damaged human beings because of their experiences. So it takes a very special recipe, an activation procedure for a young person to become a killer. And it would be great if we had some kind of criminal profiling that worked. But the truth is that in the States and in the UK, criminal profiling is pretty hit and miss. Yeah, you might get a profiler saying, well, this is the kind of person who'd do it. But it's usually retrospective. You usually catch a killer through different means. But the more that we understand risk factors, the more we have the opportunity to prevent these behaviours occurring in the long term because we can provide the correct environment, support and therapy for young people who are displaying these types of behaviours to ensure that with interventions we can deflect the outcomes. Now, as I start to talk about Aaron Campbell, let me make it clear, he is a sadistic child molester and he's a killer. He murdered his victim purely for sexual pleasure. And we are talking about a really young child in this case. Alicia Sarah McPhail was born in Glasgow Royal Infirmary on the 22nd of October 2011. She lived in Airdrie, North Lanarkshire, with her mother, Georgina Lochran, and her mum was a young mum. She also had a younger sister, by the way, who was four. She was born in 2018. There were so many lovely things to say about this child. She was well loved by her peers. She was well loved by her teachers. She was adored by her family. 
when you listen to reports from the head teacher, she says that she was constantly smiley, she was constantly happy. She loved being at school. Education for her was fun. Everything about school inspired her. She had a great gift at literacy. She loved writing. And according to her head teacher, cake baking and gymnastics were two of her favorite extracurricular activities. I think we can all reflect on children of that age and how amazingly simple the pleasures are and how this child in particular really engendered everything that childhood is about. So Alicia's parents, like a lot of parents, separated when she was young. She was three months old when they parted ways. Her father, Robert, he was 26 in 2018. He lived in Rothsay on the Isle of Bute. Let me tell you, the Isle of Bute is one of the safest places you can imagine. If you want an idyllic childhood, you want to be somewhere like that. It's got the coast, the community knows one another people leave their doors open at night. It really is that kind of place. And her father lived with his own parents and his girlfriend, Tony McLachlan. She was 17 in 2018, so she was young. You know, there's a big difference between a 17 year old and a 26 year old, but nonetheless, it was a relatively happy household. Alicia would visit her father and grandparents every other weekend, so they had a really connected relationship. On the 28th of June 2018, when Alicia was six years old, she joined the family in Rothsay for what was basically meant to be three weeks of the summer school break. It was her time to spend with her daddy. Simultaneously, in the same area, Aaron Thomas Campbell was living. He had moved there because originally he had been born in Shrewsbury in Shropshire on the 7th of May 2002. He actually moved to the Isle of Bute when he was four or five years of age and he moved there with his mother Jeanette, his father Christopher and his younger sister. The reason that his parents took him there was one single simple factor. They wanted him to grow up safe. They felt that for him and his sister, the Isle of Butte provided a really safe place for them to thrive. What an irony. What an irony that the truth is that the Isle of Butte really needed protection from him. When locals have been interviewed about Aaron, there have been lots of different stories. I'm going to tell you, I can't substantiate that these stories are true. These are anecdotal. So I'm going to tell you from the horse's mouths of those who knew him what they said. But many say that his descent into evil was pretty much there from the get-go. His upbringing was, I will be honest with you, less than ideal. And he often had arguments, disputes, fallouts with his mother who was meant to be alcoholic. Again, I can only tell you what the information I've got tells me, but she was noted for having an alcohol problem. He was tested for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it means that they have trouble concentrating, it often interferes with education. It can be pretty challenging to manage. It can be exhausting parenting an individual with ADHD. I'm not gonna deny it, I've worked with many. But he also had problems around self-harm and depression. So. Aaron had some big problems. He was struggling. And when you're living in a small area and people know you, it can be really difficult when you stand out. So it's important that we acknowledge that for him, things weren't that simple. However, from a really early age, there were some striking issues, in my opinion, that were rearing their ugly head. He was around six or seven years of age when according to people who knew him, he held a young person's head underwater for so long that that young person thought she was gonna drown. That is very scary. And also let's think about the Green River Killer. Let's think about people like Ted Bundy. Let's think about so many serial killers who talk about getting away with harming people when they were younger. 
for whatever reason, from an early age, Aaron Campbell undoubtedly had a penchant to want to do harm. Also, a neighbour of Campbell's, Lindsay Stewart, said it was 2012 and he was 10 years old at the time. And she basically found Campbell kicking her daughter and punching her daughter. And literally, she could not believe it. It was like a wild animal going for a daughter. Now, understandably, she intervened and she actually got arrested. She was charged with assault. Now, she was cleared after a two day trial, but it shows you, doesn't it? We're seeing this gravity of violence. And she even compared Campbell to the Antichrist character Damien in the 1976 horror film, The Omen, because she said he was completely out of control. As I've said, I cannot corroborate these stories. I can only tell them. As he grew up, he attended the Rothsay Academy and he was well liked. He really was, he was quite popular. He went out with his mates, he hung out, he drank, he attended parties, he was attractive, he was very fit and active. It is noted by his friends that he did have a particular predilection for gaming, especially the game Slender Man. And I'm sure that you guys, you know, you know who Slender Man is. I can't tell you anything about it because you tell me about it. But there's lots of kind of movies been made about it. And also there has been a Slender Man killing, which I will cover in the future. But Slender Man is meant to be this mythical, hugely tall, scary creature that comes and kind of like takes children, like the child catcher, but in an even more dark zone, which is hard because the child catcher was really scary and chitty chitty bang bang. But nonetheless, he was really involved in that. He also had this desire to be a YouTuber. Who would do that? What kind of psychology? What kind of psychology would make anyone in their right mind want to be a YouTuber? Anyway, he wanted to be a YouTuber and he basically posted quite a few videos to the website on his YouTube channel. And on that, he called himself Poison 3D Apple 3. I don't get it either. Poison 3D Apple 3. <laughs> anyway, that was his handle. And he would collate and post pretty gory stuff, images of a grave being dug, a gunman, a blood splattered head, but he also did vlogs and he would trampoline and he seemed like a really normal kid. That's the thing, isn't it? When you imagine a child killer, you have a identification with what you expect. And he just looks like a really box standard, pretty attractive, quite fun kid. It makes it even more scary to imagine what played out and the crime that I'm gonna talk about later on. Now, when Campbell is 15, there are certain thought processes that start being very disturbing. So he starts considering doing things like wanting to rape somebody. In fact, in 2017, that's how recent all of this is, he sent a Facebook message to a friend which was following a discussion on a documentary that she'd watched. And she actually said to Campbell that she felt scarred by watching it. Whereas he said, you know what? One day, I might kill just for the lifetime experience. Like, I'm like, I might white water raft. Maybe I'll do some waterfall climbing. I don't know, I'll bungee jump off a really high place. I've never at any point thought, what I may do is just kill somebody. But that in itself shows that he is getting these festering thoughts and feelings of emotions and experiences that very few of us would ever even on a nightmare level, went to experience, let alone conjure, because it's something we're interested in. I also want to make it clear that, again, you don't see it in the news reports, but anecdotally, there were a lot of claims by neighbours that he tortured and skinned cats. I bring this in again because a lot of research evidences that psychopaths, particularly male psychopaths, in fact, I think ultimately pretty much all male psychopaths, as in 
you don't find females going through this kind of behavior. But male psychopaths tend to have this fixation with harming cats. And there is a belief system that it's because they see them as female, feminine, feline. So to destroy a cat, to kill a cat, to maim a cat, to disembowel a cat, it's a representation of the female form. And also he carried knives, set fires to things. And according to some friends, he had a real interest in voodoo. Now they had all been doing the rounds at the time that Alicia disappeared. And I've read some newspaper reports and one of the friends who was interviewed said he was supposedly doing voodoo and that they were quite worried about him. But they never felt that they wanted to ask him about it. They just felt it was a bit weird. It was just part of who he was. And they didn't want to think that it was anything more sinister than just teen talk. And let's be honest, when you think about what you were like as a teenager, how many of us said crazy stuff? How many of us just made stuff up when we were teenagers? Just me? <laughs> Is it just me? It isn't just me. It is not just me. And you know it's not just me. In the live chat now, people might be writing, it is just you. It's not just me. I've worked with a lot of teenagers. So I know a lot of people make stuff up, including concerts that they went to, to impress the boy that they fancy. But then he realised you were lying. It's a hard day. I want to also bring in that a neighbour of Campbell said that one of the rumours that was going around was that he'd taken some pretty compromising pictures of a teen girl and one of the things he'd done was show them to his friends. So he was dealing with that sexting and then kind of humiliating her to other people. Also, this was noted by lots of people. And when we look at psychopaths and psychopathic liars, one of the key traits that we expect to experience is their uncanny ability to hold somebody's gaze. If you're a liar, at some point during your history, you'll read something that says, liars can't look in the eyes of the people they're lying to. And the liar will be like, I will just look directly in the eye and I will not move and therefore I will look so honest. But that's not how we look. It just isn't. Because when we're lying, we are aware we're lying. And therefore, if we're staring directly in your eyes to be so honest, we're going to do it too long. Natural eye gaze looks away. You hold the gaze, but you don't hold it too long to make the person uncomfortable. So unfortunately, because liars have learned that looking in the eyes directly makes you seem honest, they've gone OTT with it. And it feels like Aaron was like that. He'd learned that somewhere. And he used to really hold people's gaze far longer than was considered polite. In fact, the result was it made people feel uncomfortable. This translated to the courtroom. He held that lingering stare with Alicia's grandma, Angela King. When she was looking at him from the witness stand, while she was telling the jury about how beautiful her little granddaughter had been, he would just sit and stare, just eyeball her. And that was everywhere. If he was on the bus going to school, he would just be taking people in. He would just stare you right back in your eyes and hold your gaze. Gives me the heebie-jeebies. Now, Campbell himself obviously came from a small area and the people who were involved in the scenario that plays out are Tony McLaughlin, who acted to some degree as Alicia's stepmom, and Robert McPhail, her father. And there was this awkward situation, according to Campbell, which is that he was having sex with Tony McLaughlin. She denies it. But that's what he said. He said that they would have casual sex and also he would go and visit Robin McPhail who dealt cannabis. So there was this like kind of triangular relationship. In the winter of 2017, 
he said that he was basically regularly procuring cannabis off Robert McPhail. And that would happen on a regular basis. But by 2018, these kind of interactions had stopped. And that was because he had had a disagreement with his mother. Basically, Aaron Campbell's mother, as much as she is accused of being an alcoholic, she's also a mother who doesn't want her son involved with drugs. She finds out that Aaron is smoking drugs and she felt powerless to stop, but she tries her best to intervene to prevent him buying cannabis. It's worth noting as well that Aaron's father, Christopher, is an oil industry worker, so he's constantly overseas. Now, Jeanette, Aaron Campbell's mother, really hoped that the cannabis was just a phase. She just thought it'd grow out of it because like a lot of small towns, a lot of small islands, drugs were rife. I can look back at my own childhood and be like, as soon as it hit September, October, we were like, Silas Ivan, where's the magic mushrooms? Let's go and pick thousands of them. Because there was little to do. It was that spotting sheep, staying in your bedroom, wearing oversized jumpers, and dreaming of the day that you could get fake ID. That was pretty much life in a small town. So it's not unusual. Drugs are rife in small areas. My own husband grew up in Saltburn and it was just like a drugs trajectory for years. Not because kids are trying to be dependent, because it's really boring growing up in certain places and hallucinogenics can actually really help pass the time. And then you get older and you realize that there are actually things that you can fill your life with, but the truth is that this is really not abnormal. And I wanna make that point because I think that it's really easy to suggest that these kids who take drugs are bad kids, but it's not, they're just kids. And they're just really normal average kids in small areas, bored, trying to fill the time. On the 1st of July 2018, that's three days into Alicia's summer visit, she's put to bed at her grandparents' seafront home. They play a Peppa Pig DVD, and around 11 p.m., she's checked on. And Tony checks on that little girl and notices that she's asleep. Like in so many small places where Everybody believes it's safe. The key was left in the front door. It's hard for people in big cities to imagine that, isn't it? That no one's really that scared. But it's the way that so many people grow up in small areas. You don't expect crime. Your neighbors are your friends. Your friends are your community. You have nothing to fear. Simultaneously on that evening, Aaron Campbell has 15 friends to his house. They drink heavily and the party finishes just before midnight. Around 12.30 a.m., just after that party ends, a friend actually comes back to Aaron Campbell's home and finds him in a real state. In fact, Aaron Campbell felt suicidal. He was laying in bed and the friend was really concerned about it. Now, when the friend questions Campbell on why he's so suicidal, he basically says, you know, I was arguing with my mum and I've just felt like I don't wanna be here anymore. Understandably, his friend's really worried for him and says, look, I will spend the night with you, but he doesn't want them to. He says he's gonna get stoned and at that point, it feels like he decided that as opposed to just go to sleep, he was going to score some weed. So he sends lots of messages to people asking if they can sell him cannabis. And that includes Robert McPhail. So at 1.47am and 1.48am, he calls Tony McLachlan, that's McPhail's girlfriend, but doesn't get any responses. And he's not happy. Now, obviously, let's be honest, Aaron Campbell is feeling very down. I appreciate that. He's not in the best of places. Saying you're suicidal at 16 is really hardcore. He's not having a happy time. But I really struggle to understand why that feeling would provoke him to want 
to take a knife so that he could go and rob cannabis from Alicia McPhail's father. Because that's what his decision is. At 1.54 a.m., he takes a kitchen knife, he enters the McPhail property, which is around five minutes away from where his home is, and he goes in, albeit apparently to take cannabis. But Alicia's room is closest to the front door. And he finds her, this sleeping, little, beautiful, blonde child. And in his own words, he sees a moment of opportunity. Later, he claims, all I thought about was killing her once I saw her. Think about how you would feel seeing a beautiful little blonde girl lay in bed or snuggled up just after watching her Peppa Pig video tucked up, nice and safe. What would you think? But he just thought, all I could think about was killing her. He lifts her out of bed. She's drowsy at the time, not quite present. He leaves the house with her. No one notices, no one's expecting it. And then he begins to walk along the ocean shore and she wakes up because it's cold. She wakes up in his arms, in this stranger's arms. And she asks, who are you? And Aaron Campbell says that he knows her dad and he's taking her home. I just want to play you now, the judge reading this part out. And I want you to hear it because I want you to hear Alicia's mother in the background howling. At one point she asked who you were and where you were going. You said you were a friend of her father's and that you were taking her home. Aaron Campbell then carries Alicia to a secluded location. He then rapes her and he murders her. It's unbelievable to imagine that this is a 16 year old man. Boy, 16, abducts, rapes and murders this innocent child. He then returns to his house in the early hours of the morning. He takes a shower and then he goes back to the scene of the murder to get his phone that he's dropped and also because he wants to dump his clothes. At 6 a.m. on the 2nd of July, Alicia's grandfather wakes up and he goes, as you would, to check on your granddaughter. And she isn't there. They frantically search the house. She's never run away before, why would she? Her bike's in the garden, so she's not gone for a bike ride. And Alicia's grandmother, Angela King, notifies the police at 6.23. The rest of the family are going crazy. They are searching the local area. They are spreading the word of a disappearance. They are asking everyone if they have seen her. King also goes online and puts on Facebook that the child is missing and just asks anybody with any knowledge to please get in contact. It's at this point that McLachlan also notices that Aaron Campbell's called her on several occasions. So they call him back and they say, what did you want? You know, we've lost our child. And he responds with a sorry doesn't matter with a laughing emoji. And then they respond and say, look, we're looking for Alicia. And he writes, oh, damn. I'm sure she's not went too far. Kiss. On one level, that's something you might expect. On another, that's an admission, isn't it? Because she hadn't gone too far. 
The police take this really seriously. This is a young child. They start hunting for her using all the resources. They have the helicopter out, the coast guard. They get volunteers searching the shoreline. This is by 6.55 a.m. Just think about that. Think about some of the missing cases where we're told to wait 24 hours before we even start looking. This is within minutes. One of the volunteers searching discovers a knife near the McVale home. So that's the first concerning incident. But then, at 8.54 a.m., the police are told by George Williams, a local man, who'd seen King's Facebook appeal, that he'd discovered Alicia's lifeless and naked body. She was found in a wooded area and he said, I've found the wee girl. She's naked. She's dead. So horrific was that scene that the police who attended the scene cried as he recalled finding the little girl's bruised body, rigid, with blue lips. About 15 minutes after that little girl's body was found, her mother, Georgina Lochran, who was 70 miles away in Airdrie, learnt about her daughter's death via Facebook. Can you imagine that? She learnt about her daughter's murder via Facebook. The post-mortem that was carried out was horrific. It was conducted on the 3rd of July, 2018. And it concluded that Alicia McPhail had over 117 injuries. Some of them were caused when she was alive, and yes, some of them were caused potentially when she was dead and was being dragged through vegetation. But I'm going to tell you about some of the court autopsy report now. It said, External examination showed petechial pinpoint hemorrhages around the eye, within the lining of the eyes, within the mucosal lining of the mouth and on the tongue. Examination has shown multiple foci of bruising to the anterior, i.e. front neck structures, including bruising around her larynx and trachea. There was further bruising within the musculature of the back of the neck. There were areas of deep bruising within her face, including around the mouth and over the right cheek. The pattern of injuries to the face and neck is indicative of inflicted trauma and is consistent with manual gripping of the neck and face with a hand or hands. And the injuries around the mouth would be consistent with external covering of the mouth and nose, i.e. smothering. Examination of the spinal column within the neck revealed hemorrhaging involving the invertebral discs along with a small amount of hemorrhage over the spinal cord. These findings are consistent with forceful movement of the head and neck. For example, through shaking. There were severe injuries to the genitalia, including marked, deep, extensive lacerations, tears to the vagina and anus, with obliteration of the perineum the area of the skin and tissue between the vagina and anus. These injuries are consistent with severe, forceful, inflicted penetration of the vagina and anus. There was only a thin film of tissue remaining between the vagina and anus, and also between the vagina and abdominal cavity. The injuries to the genitalia would be expected to bleed significantly the presence of associated bruising and hemorrhage confirming at least some of these injuries have been inflicted in life. The injuries to her neck and face indicated that she had been gripped, while injuries to her nose and mouth indicated that she had been smothered. Her genitalia sustained catastrophic injuries. Her death was determined to be the result of significant forceful pressure to her neck and face. 
The police obviously immediately opened a murder investigation following the results of the autopsy. Chief Superintendent Hazel Hedren, the local police commander, made a statement saying, every available resource from across Police Scotland is being made available to this major investigation. Detective Superintendent Stuart Houston made a plea for information from the public, the response to which was significant. The police conducted searches at the McPhail residence while heavily patrolling the streets of Boot and making house-to-house -house inquiries. They went everywhere. They went everywhere. No stone was left unturned. Several parts of the islands were even cordoned off because forensic experts wanted to search for evidence and investigators believed from the get-go the murderer didn't just be in Butte at that time, that they lived there, that they came from Butte. Jeanette Campbell, Aaron Campbell's mother, she may be an alcoholic, I don't know, it's anecdotal, she may have her problems, but she's also a really good citizen because she instantly is out there looking for Alicia McPhail. And not just that, she's so desperate to help the search that when the police say, look, if anybody has any CCTV, please send it to us. So she checks. She checks her own CCTV system. It's installed outside her home. And there he is. Her son. Leaving and returning twice during the hours that Alicia McPhail disappeared. So she asks him, why have I got this footage of you leaving and coming home? And he said, it's nothing to do with me. I don't have anything to do with the girl's death. And of course, his mother believed him, of course. She's happy with that explanation. Why would her son be responsible for the murder and rape of a child? And because she is that convinced that Aaron is telling the truth, and because she is that good a citizen, she hands the footage to the police to eliminate her son from their inquiries, putting her son directly in the frame. When they bring him in initially, he's interviewed by Detective Constable Gavin McKellar. He's a witness, right? He's done nothing wrong. Cooperates brilliantly, answers the questions amazingly, shows no sign whatsoever of worry, is not intimidated. In fact, the only thing he wants to admit is, okay, okay, I was buying weed. I was smoking weed. It's hardly like a class A drug and it's hardly an issue, right? Let's be honest. You can get caught with cannabis and they're like, don't do it again. And you're like, I won't. Well, I'll only smoke the bit that I've got in my room. But you know what I mean? At the end of the day, no big deal. No big deal. So he causes them no suspicion. He has just brutally raped, murdered, horrifically assaulted and destroyed and decimated a child's life. He is interviewed by the police and he is cool as a cucumber. He's arrested in the end on the 4th of July. And at this point, he's taken to the police station in Glasgow and he just does what I always find the most important thing to do when you're being questioned by police if you want to make yourself seem innocent. He answered, no comments. If any criminal is watching this, maybe you're bored and you've just carried out a crime, I don't know, just don't do that because everyone knows you're guilty straight away. If you say no comment, it means, well, I did it. Like, no comment, I'm definitely guilty. No comment, it was definitely me. No comment, I'm not gonna answer because I'm gonna incriminate myself further. Just don't do it. No comment does not work anymore. He'd been watching too many 1980s films, I don't know. The next day, he's charged with the murder and rape of Alicia McPhail and remanded in custody, of course. And on the 13th of July, he appears in Greenock Sheriff Court without a guilty plea. So he's not at this point saying that he's done it. Arrogance, another psychopathic trait. 
Aaron Campbell appears at the High Court in Glasgow on the 10th of December 2018. That's where he's given his indictment. He enters a not guilty plea to the charge of abducting, raping and murdering Alicia McVeigh. They set the trial for February 2019 with Ian McSporran. Sorry. This isn't funny. What I'm talking about isn't funny. But a QC who's called Ian McSporran and who's Scottish just makes me want to laugh. Sorry. Ian McSporran. Anyway, he was the QC. He's prosecuting, and then there's Brian McConaughey, QC, acting as Campbell's defence advocate. I instantly believe that Ian McSporran deserves to win every case. And right now, in my head, he's in a guilt. Is it just me? With a Sporran? It is just me, isn't it? I apologise. I will gather myself. He also gets a second charge of attempting to defeat the ends of justice. Now, this was dropped before the trial because basically he was younger than 18. And because he's younger than 18, at this point, the press are not actually allowed to report Campbell's name for the duration of the trial. We're all on the fence. I know a lot of you will think Aaron Campbell's name should have been everywhere. But remember, with young people, there is still an understanding that their brains are developing and we have to be aware of that. If we can rehabilitate and restore young people into a just way of living in the future, that's good. So it is not always in the public interest to know who has murdered whoever, purely because that individual could be rehabilitated. Or it comes down to this person, I'm going to read you some stuff in a bit that's going to make you go, I think they're wrong, which is why we probably know his name. The trial begins on 11th of February. I don't know why I sounded like Pinocchio then either, but just acknowledge I recognised it when I was doing the voice. But the trial begins on the 11th of February 2019. Judge Lord Matthews is presiding and he is a force to be reckoned with. Now, the court has shown CCTV footage from the cameras where Campbell's mother had them installed. So she handed that over to the police and they managed to capture the defendant leaving his house around 1.54 a.m. on the 2nd of July. He then returns back at 3.35 a.m. Then he leaves and returns again for two pretty short periods of time. That's both occurring before 4.07 a.m. There is also other CCTV footage supplied by members of the public. And whilst you can't quite see who it is, you can see there's an individual walking along the shoreline around 2.25 and 2.26 a.m. And that image looks as if the person who is walking on that shoreline is carrying something in his arms, which we can all assume is Alicia. Now, the pathologist who talked in court, that's Dr. John Williams, testified that Alicia's feet were clean and uninjured, which therefore suggests that she was carried to her death. Jeanette Campbell, so Aaron's mother, confirmed that when the items that were recovered from the beach after Alicia's death, were recovered, included a fleece, jackets, jogging bottoms, boxers, a t-shirt, a kitchen knife that she actually said belonged to her son and that came from her kitchen, and also the fibres from the trousers that were found on Alicia's discarded pyjamas also matched his clothing. Must have been really hard for his mother. Because remember, she gave over that CCTV footage because she genuinely believed her son was just completely innocent. She was counting him out of the investigation. She wasn't putting him centre stage. Another forensic scientist who was involved in the court proceedings, Stuart Bailey, also testified that the DNA matched the accused. So Aaron Campbell's DNA was found on the beach clothing and also... He said that a DNA sample taken from Alicia's neck had a billion, a billion to one chance of coming from anybody but Campbell. Billion to one chance. And DNA matches were also found on Alicia's face, on floating parts of her body and some of her clothing. 
A cybercrime expert actually told the court that on the 3rd of July 2018, when they were looking at Campbell's phone records, he had actually Googled how do police find DNA. And then he'd even visited a web page titled Collecting DNA Evidence. If that wasn't enough, a 16-year-old girl testified that hours after Alicia's body was discovered, Aaron Campbell actually sent a Snapchat video of his uppy body to a group of 25 people that he knew with the words, found the guy, who's done it? What is it about psychopaths who just can't help but taunt the world with their work? Is it just me? But every time I cover cases like this, I'm blown away by the desire to share the story, the work. And I feel like Aaron Campbell was noting that. Yeah, he wasn't saying, I killed and raped Alicia McPhail. He's saying, you know what, I found the guy who done it. It's cryptic, but it's real. Now, of course, Aaron Campbell's like, none of that happened. He says instead, on the 2nd of July, yes, I was out in the early hours. I was procuring cannabis. This is what I was doing. That's all I did. I procured cannabis and I then lost my phone. Now, he did in court bring in people who testified that they had received messages from him. But they also said, yeah, we did get messages. He was looking for weed, but we didn't meet him because he didn't turn up and he obviously got sorted elsewhere. It's at the same point in court that Campbell also logs what's known as a special defense of incrimination. And do you know what he did? He accused Tony McLaughlin. That's right, the teenage girlfriend of Alicia's father of being Alicia's murderer. In fact, he said that she had had sex with him that evening in the garage. And then she had murdered Alicia and taken the contents of the condom that she'd used with Aaron Campbell to put semen on the child's body. Can you imagine how that would be for her? It really doesn't matter that she knew she was innocent. It really doesn't matter that that's the biggest tall tale and it's obvious that he's making it up. What matters is the fact that on top of doing what he has done to this poor family, murdering this child, ruining the lives of so many, he is now trying to incriminate an innocent young girl, and she was a young girl. In fact, Campbell's lawyer said that Tony McLaughlin was jealous of Alicia's relationship with her father, and that he was also somebody that she felt should pay her more attention. And so the way that she wanted to make sure that that occurred was to kill his daughter. All of Alicia's family said, this is just lies. Tony McLaughlin was a loving stepmother. She loved the child to pieces. And she was a wonderful stepmother to that gorgeous girl. Even Angela King, Alicia's grandmother said, you know, Tony and Alicia had the most wonderful relationship. Aaron Campbell in court answered questions for two hours. He offered loads of explanations to the prosecution's evidence. He was very fluent, very able to compose himself. He was completely unfazed, very articulate, didn't seem to be at all concerned. He even told the court he'd never even met Alicia McPhail. He said he definitely didn't kill her. In fact, his words were, absolutely not, I could never do that. He agreed that then trying to deflect the blame onto Tony would actually be evil. So he even agrees that the things that he's just done would be evil, even though he'd done them. And then even though he acknowledged that Tony McLaughlin wouldn't be able to lift Alicia for the distance that she was apparently meant to carry her, he does acknowledge that he can bench press 50 kg. I mean, you know, even though he's being tried for murder and trying to get away with it, 
is he gonna wanna deny that he can like bench press 50 kg? No, arrogance wins every time. He's like, oh, this could really incriminate me. But mm, I can bench press 50 kg. Just can't help himself. Psychopaths can't, can they? Can't help themselves. Do you wanna get off with murder? Or do you wanna admit that you've got some great guns? But nonetheless, it's clear to the jury that Aaron Campbell is guilty as hell. The trial itself lasts nine days. It takes them three hours, that's all. And it's hard to do that in three hours. Look, I laugh about certain people being found guilty in like nine minutes, okay? I get it, you know? There are some where you just wanna send them down straight away, it's obvious. It's just so incriminating. But we're talking about a young man here. We're talking about a young person. It's really difficult to agree that that person could definitely be the individual who is responsible for such a heinous murder. It's awful, it goes against the grain of what we expect for young people. So three hours is a really short time and it's unanimous. Every member of the jury finds him guilty and he's found guilty on the 21st of February. And I'll tell you what Lord Matthews, who is a powerful, powerful judge, describes when he talks about the evidence against him. He says, the evidence was overwhelming and that the teenager had committed some of the most wicked and evil crimes this court has ever heard of in decades of dealing with depravity. And Campbell was completely emotionless upon hearing his conviction. He genuinely didn't react. And at this point, the press go crazy. They're like, everyone needs to know who this is. And so even though initially he was kept anonymous, following the trial, Lord Matthews agreed to reverse the naming restriction. And that was a first in Scottish history, a first. Now Campbell reappeared before Lord Matthews for his sentencing on the 21st of March. And by this point, there were reports by a clinical psychologist, a social worker, and also, at this point, he had confessed to the crime in detail. So we now have not only a guilty verdict, Campbell said, okay, it was me. He told the professionals that he was involved in that he was quite satisfied with the murder. He said, it even took everything to stop me laughing during points in the trial. How does that make you feel? He was satisfied with his work and he found the trial funny. Matthews described Campbell as a cold, calculating, remorseless and dangerous individual, completely lacking in victim empathy. And he handed him a life sentence with a minimum term of 27 years. That means that Campbell would be eligible for parole when he's 43. Still got a whole life to lead, hasn't he? 43. The judge even said, if it hadn't been for your age, it would have been a higher term. But the truth is, research says that reintegration and rehabilitation are remote possibilities. He also said, perhaps in your case, impossible. He also stressed that the claims against Tony McLaughlin were a travesty of the truth and that a young woman was completely innocent of those charges. The judge said, in imposing sentence, I am conscious that you are a child. In sentencing children, it has to be borne in mind that they are not fully yet rounded, mature human beings. A child's best interests are a primary consideration and the desirability of the child's reintegration into society must also be taken into account. However, the weight to be given to the various sentencing considerations will depend on a number of factors, including the age of the child and all the circumstances of the case. The nature of these appalling offences and what I have read in the reports, make it clear to me that reintegration 
and rehabilitation, while these are important considerations, are remote possibilities. And neither your best interests nor anyone else's will be served by a speedy return to the community. Nonetheless, the punishment part will not be as long as it would have been had you been an adult. Campbell is imprisoned at HM Young Offenders Institution, Polmont, and he'll be moved to an adult prison when he turns 21. He's been given leave to appeal his sentence and that was heard on the 7th of August, 2019. So I'm gonna tell you what they brought forward on the 7th of August, 2019. The expert said this, Aaron Campbell presents with a range of traits on the psychopathy checklist. A superficial, shallow and insincere interpersonal style and a grossly inflated view of his abilities. Emotional affective deficits, including a lack of remorse, shallow emotions and a callous lack of empathy. A chronic and excessive need for stimulation an inability or unwillingness to formulate plans or commitments and serious criminal behaviour. Aaron Campbell presents with a wide range of risk factors for sexual offending, including deviant sexual interests in sexual violence and sexual contact with children, an obsession and preoccupation with extreme sexual thoughts, attitudes that support his sex offending and unwillingness to challenge or change his sexually deviant thinking. Prior adult sanctions for exhibiting sexually inappropriate behaviours, excessive violence during his sexual crime, sexual crimes against a child who was also a stranger, diverse sexual assault behaviours, an antisocial interpersonal orientation, a lack of intimate peer relationships, recent escalation in negative effect impulsivity and poor regulation, a dysfunctional home environment and problematic relationships with his parents. Dr. McPherson's conclusion was this, I am of the view that the capacity for change may be limited due to the nature of Aaron Campbell's personality structure and his complex risk factors. I apologise to the court for appearing pessimistic. However, I am not confident that Aaron Campbell has the capacity or desire to change his behaviour in any meaningful way. And as such, the risks will remain for the foreseeable future. Another expert who treated him in prison said, the data suggests that Aaron Campbell's journey to this extreme offence was consequent to a myriad of factors that are consistent with a dangerous and severe personality disorder. And whilst the combination of these distal factors were highly potent, it seems that it appears that when he decided to kill Alicia McPhail, he was thinking and acting in a way that allowed him to experience motivation and justification for her rape and murder. In addition, since that time, He's shown a lack of remorse or empathy for his offending or any real appreciation of the impact of his crime. Like Dr. McPherson, she identified traits which she classified as coming within the descriptions of antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder, and a sadistic personality. The offences showed the hallmarks of a sadistic sexual murder. And on the issue of capacity for change, she stated, it's impossible to conclusively say whether or not change is possible. In sum, taking the totality of information available to me, I've concluded that whilst the reintegration and rehabilitation of Aaron Campbell will be very challenging, it is not necessarily impossible. However, when you really go into the report, I would say, that she knows exactly how she really feels. And actually she finally says, I cannot confidently exclude the possibility that at least some, if not many aspects of his account lack veracity. The appellant used many and diverse cognitive justifications and rationalizations for his behavior. And the reason that she said that 
is because even when he's been in prison and he's attended courses, courses that are meant to have helped him to navigate and negotiate the reality of his actions, those running them said, he just said and did whatever he was required. But he didn't mean any of it. And that he didn't change at all. They don't expect him to behave badly in prison. It's not his breeding ground for crime. But they also don't expect him to change. In fact, they see Aaron Campbell as an individual with such psychopathic traits and narcissistic traits that it really won't matter how long he's behind bars. Because when it comes down to it, you can't really change the complete temperament that that individual is not just born, but bred with. Anybody who was around at the time of Alicia McPhail's murder will know that there was a huge amount of media attention. The level of revulsion that this crime created was horrific. However, ironically, Aaron Campbell got his extra day in court because he got his sentence reduced. So he won't serve 27 years, it'll be 24 before they look at him for parole. And you know what that makes me think? It makes me think that he can't be rehabilitated. Because if you come to terms with the fact that you have raped and sadistically murdered a child, would you really believe that you deserved less time than you were given? Or would your conscience tell you that you didn't deserve to walk freely at all? It's changed Butte forever. That community doesn't feel safe anymore. Locals say that nothing feels the same. The McPhail trial revealed that even in places where we imagine that there is safety because of the gorgeous scenery and the community spirit, that the truth is that if you scratch beneath the surface, beneath the picture postcard lifestyle, the chances are that there will be a subculture where deprivation is growing. One thing I would say that was amazing is that the local young people were all offered counselling to help them deal with the repercussions of the case. And I think that's testament to an organisation that we need more of when these kind of cases unfold. And I think we also need to acknowledge that when we think about children's behaviour, such as high levels of smoking cannabis, watching lots of violent video games, particularly when it came down to things like Slender Man, the fact that Aaron Campbell was posting very odd YouTube posts, and also the links that we have between cannabis and psychosis, that we should always take those issues seriously. We are too quick to say this is just normal behaviour for young people. Every young person is a unique individual and every young people needs to be explored in that way. I'm not saying it would have changed the outcome. I'm saying that sometimes stereotypes of teenagers are highly unhelpful when you look at cases like this. It's also worth mentioning that Dr. John Marshall, who actually assessed Campbell after his conviction, argued that we need to do so much more around testing for psychopathic traits because if you do find that a child exhibits psychopathic traits, then there are interventions such as compassion training and biofeedback and working with them therapeutically and helping families coordinate a more cohesive approach to family life that can change the outcomes. It's essential that we don't just learn from these events after they happen. Instead, we use what we learn to instigate and change the possibilities of other children's outcomes. Like I said, some of you are gonna struggle with this one because at that 2019 appeal, his lawyers claimed that the sentence was excessive and they compared it to other cases and it meant that he had that sentence reduced and you may really struggle for it. Even more so, I will acknowledge that if you look this case up, the lawyers for Campbell said he had suffered a miscarriage of justice. 
That's right. His lawyer said that he had suffered a miscarriage of justice because his sentence was too long. I think we all know how I feel. But basically, they felt that because he was 16 at the time, he should be given the opportunity to be rehabilitated. I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. It's been a long one. It's one that I've covered on documentaries before, and it's one that I wanted to cover in depth today. I hope that I have given you some food for thought. I would love to know whether you think that he should have had his sentence reduced or whether you think that he is ever going to be safe to walk the streets again. Certainly the forensic sites and clinical sites and psychiatrists that assessed him, I get the feeling that they don't. But I'm just telling the story. Let me know your thoughts and join me next time. And if you've enjoyed this, please do subscribe so you never miss any of my work on a Wednesday and a Sunday. See you next time and thanks for your support on Patreon.